it's great to see a lot of familiar faces, uh, some faces I've seen in Twitter form, and, um, and folks I uh, have yet to, met, to meet. Sorry. Um, it's also a distinct honor to be back at this hotel where I last attended a Star Trek convention. <laughs> I was in my 30s at the time. I still am in my 30s. So let's just say this was a recent Star Trek convention I attended in this room here. I did not speak at the Star Trek convention. Today I do want to speak about um, some of my experiences on two different worlds. Uh, one world of uh, the academic geographer, or if you want to jazz it up a bit, the academic GI scientist. and. Uh, and in industry, working with geodata. Uh, I think these two worlds are coming at very similar problems from very similar perspectives, but there are a lot of missed connections. So I'd like to identify a few uh, missed connections I've found in my own work uh, that some of my colleagues have found, uh, and also maybe identify a few Nice, uh, nice concrete projects that have brought together academics and industry folks. And, and finally, I'll give a few thoughts on how we can all work together a bit better and bridge these two worlds of the academic and the industry approaches to geodata. Uh, if you have any clarification questions or quick questions while I'm speaking, please raise your hand. I'm glad to stop and take your question. Uh, I'll also save more time at the end for general discussion, and uh, I welcome your disagreement and your correction of some of my um, some of the arguments I'm trying to make here. So, in the title of my talk, I'm riffing on uh, the two cultures, which C.P. Snow, a uh, a very successful academic and a less successful novelist uh, wrote about this gap between humanists and scientists in Britain in the turn of the, or sorry, mid-century, time of World War II, how these two cultures were approaching similar problems with very dissimilar vocabularies, completely talking past each other, going to different dinner parties, this is Britain, so they're all in their small little world, British dons, small little world. They couldn't even talk at a dinner party about their, um, their approaches to similar problems. I'm going to try to give my own capsule history of what's happened in academic computational geography and what's happened in the geo industry in the meantime, and try to tell a bit of a story of a mismatch where we've also been having trouble having successful dinner, dinner party conversations between people in industry and people in the academic world. And I think part of this has to do with the trends in the academic world and the trends in industry. So if you look on the, on the academic side, we had a golden age back in the first half of the century. Geography went from being a, a, a not very quantitative subject to one that had some rigor behind it that could actually work with the other sciences towards answering questions about, um, about cities, about distribution of economies, about the way people live around the world. And then it fell apart. The Harvard, Harvard shut down its geography program, Stanford shut theirs down, Yale shut theirs down, Michigan shut theirs down. And this wasn't just budget cuts. This was the fact that uh, that, that type of geographic research was no longer relevant and it wasn't made relevant to other parts of the academic world and to other disciplines. Uh, Post-war, there was a rebirth very focused on computational aspects. 
uh, very focused on now that we have digital computers, what can we what can we take out of a map and run statistics on and answer very concrete questions. That again made geography relevant to disciplines outside of its immediate scope. Uh, another set of budget cuts. And now we've gotten into a little bit of a stasis. We have this term of geographic information science that I think does a very good job of showing how geographic information can be relevant in practical ways as well as theoretical ways towards not just a static understanding of people and environments, but towards actually understanding the processes involved. But the context still is one of downward drift on the academic side. This is also me talking as a recovered academic myself. So, yes, please. When you say that kind of geography, uh, when they shuttered the geography departments, that because that, type, that kind of geography that they were practicing is no longer relevant, what do you mean by that kind of geography? What are you talking about? Uh, so in the, this, this, first, um, this first wave of geography here was, um, it, it was a systematic approach towards studying human and environment relations. So like saying, how do a natural disaster is a combination of a environmental process and the fact that there are people and man-made structures in the way and it's that confluence uh, this i'd say this sort of approach that geography was taking at the time was very wide-ranging bringing in a lot of aspects of the humanities and the social sciences and telling very compelling stories about how a natural disaster is more than just a landslide and that it's human and physical processes. In this first wave, I don't, that was disconnected from quantitative data. It was a qualitative story being told. In the second wave here, it may have swung a little too much towards the quantitative direction of, say, summarizing a natural disaster with just statistics about damage done, population, and coming back with uh, statistical summaries rather than that compelling story. I did, did that provide a little more context? That's what Great. Is there like a shift from qualitative to quantitative? Yeah, so question was a shift from uh, qualitative to quantitative. Uh, yes, I, it, up at 30,000 feet, I think it's safe to say qualitative quantitative, some attempt at a, combi a computational combination of the two, which much harder to do than to say. On the industry side, again, this is my very selective uh, uh, history from 30,000 feet. Main takeaway, upward drift in market valuations and employment and in opportunities for individuals who are curious about geographic topics. Uh, we had GIS, Geographic Information Systems, coming out of um, land resource management, uh, first on mainframes, first requiring a lot of sophisticated equipment and trained staff, turning into something that can be run on a personal computer, on a desktop. This is all old hat. Most people are familiar with this. Where it gets interesting is when you overlay this history on the academic history. And now we've had uh, at least two waves of attempts to turn uh, what works on mainframes and on personal computers into technology that's relevant to end users, to consumers, and that uh, can solve everyday problems rather than just, um, just questions in the context of a bureaucracy that's, say, uh, deciding where to cut down trees in Canada. 
which I don't, which is a great problem um, to have. But it's also great to have it in the context of a lot of other problems and to find commonalities between managing trees, managing uh, transportation network companies, also known as ride sharing. And personally, one thing I find very stimulating right now is that there are a lot of different users of geotech software who are finding out how it's relevant to many, many different problems and finding the commonalities between these. That's where the qualitative folks back in the golden age of geography, I think we're having that kind of fun, that kind of fun of finding connections between, um, between applying one computational technique well, even if it was a qualitative technique, applying one technique towards one topic and finding how it's relevant to another topic as well. What I find unfortunate in this mismatch is that the industry side and the academic side have actually made a lot of progress in the meantime, and I don't know if we're aware of what the other side has been working on. I don't know if in this the fact that times were good on the academic in the academic world here and not so great in industry here meant that there wasn't a dinner party involving all of these folks. I mean dinner party kind of metaphorically there. So I just wanted to identify a couple missed connections that I've come across. Uh, th this is a selective little overview of some projects that I've happened to be involved in. Uh, I think others would probably pick, pick different topics. Uh, in, the, in academic geography, uh, this notion of, a, um, of time geography goes back towards the middle of the century where computational geographers have had techniques for describing not just people's travels throughout the day, but how their travel can expand or contract based on their temporal obligations. This is effectively describing the life of a parent, of how far can you go out before you have to get home to take care of your kid? Or if it's a series of chained destinations, how far can you go before you need to get to daycare to do a pickup to get home to sequence of steps? Very well established in the academic world. Industry folks all of a sudden are trying to reinvent this from scratch because these are the dynamics behind a transportation network company, behind managing ride shares that match drivers and riders, or that match one driver with n number of riders traveling to n number of destinations. Um, I've yet to find an overlap between these two worlds here, but they're working on similar problems. We often talk just about geographic data while realizing that we're also working with temporal data. Uh, industry has been approaching this in a very simplistic snapshot manner. The state of space at time x, the state of space at time x plus one. You can, you can solve problems that way, but not all problems because as, as the academic types who have gone, let's just say they've taken a deep dive and they've built an ontology to model geospatial temporal aspects. Uh, ontology is probably the, using the word ontology is probably the quickest way to turn off industry folks who want to solve their problem and get out the door. At the same time, this gap between where we're at on the industry side and where the, the, the I, an ideal complete solution the academic folks have sketched out is identifying 
like if we could bridge this, we could actually solve some more complex problems because if you want to explain a process, if you want to explain why a geographic phenomena is happening, you need more than snapshot views. You need more than information of this follows that. You need some understanding of this persists for that long or this leads to that. This obviously is not this type of a complex ontology where you're differentiating between oh, uh, scattered, instant, intervals, events, settings, aggregates. You need a whole glossary to understand that. Too complex. This is not something you would bring to a dinner party that connects academic and industry folks. At the same time, this W3C spec is also something that would shut down that kind of a conversation. I don't want to harp on, the, on negatives here. What I'd like to highlight are opportunities where folks from very different backgrounds are working on similar problems and could actually learn a lot from each other. Uh, distributed analysis, also known as big data, very widespread throughout the academic and industry worlds right now. When it comes to geographic data, where you have, um, let's just say where you have latitude and longitude and things have a spatial relationship to each other that can confound the basics of a map reduce algorithm where you are taking independent pieces of data and farming them off to parallel processes. Um, out of the box, Hadoop running its own form of MapReduce does not work well with spatial data. Academic folks have approached this sort of topic. Let's just say they don't necessarily have an industry leading open source solution to it that, um, that people closer to a specific problem can just take off the shelf and apply and, uh, and run a distributed process on geographic data. Again, two worlds very close to addressing the same problem, very close to making software that could actually solve problems on both sides of this divide. Uh, privacy, another topic all across the tech industry that's, that's um, let's just say it's gaining more interest for a variety of reasons beyond just our immediate industry. Uh, and just as how distributing geographic processing is more complex than distributing the processing of uh, uh, purely independent variables. Anonymizing and ensuring privacy of geographic data is a more complex proposition. You have issues like mobile devices like Apple's phones that have been logging the positions of their users. And then even if you try to take a stab at anonymizing that kind of data, you get issues where more recently, a, a data dump of New York City taxi drivers that was supp supposedly anonymized, uh, researchers could actually uh, backtrace through it and derive some, use some simple little heuristics to say this is the same driver in this run as in that run. Uh, This is another topic where academic folks have been dealing with these issues. I won't take, I won't let uh, uh, say it's geographers that have been doing it. It's actually public health people because public health people have been collecting locations of uh, say cancer patients for quite a long time and have developed a lot of techniques for aggregating 
very sensitive information and anonymizing it in a way that uh, researchers can use it to do aggregate analysis, but without compromising the privacy of individuals. So another case where people are coming at this question of how do you protect the privacy of people and their geographic information, another case of industry, the academic world, and some very different fields. Tr I'll try and answer the same question, um, maybe not talking with each other. Mm. I'm going to skip a couple, uh, move it along. Of one, final, one final example of a missed connection. Uh, I'll, I'll end with, with one of my own, where in, in grad school, uh, I did my own dissertation studying the spatial knowledge that people gain from their travels around the world. So what are they learning? What sorts of mental maps are they building up as they travel from work to home to tourist destinations every day? Uh, at the time, both Apple and Google had released, had recently released their sat nav systems for their phones, and they had a small little difference. All this has changed, but at the time, the iPhone navigation system would automatically pan and zoom you from one step to the next. You do this turn, you press the next button, it automatically pans and zooms this view. It gives you the next instruction. At the time, the Google interface was manual. You press the advance button and it lets you, let's just say, you're left with the task of panning and zooming this map. The next instruction might actually be off screen. You might have to zoom out, find that instruction, find that turn, and, uh, and then you could proceed. So a bit more to balance if you were driving a car. But this, this little fluke of a difference actually led to different outcomes in people's performance. So what I did with a bunch of research assistants was have people walk through a, um, a, a neighborhood they weren't familiar with. They first took a walk using one of these devices, following the instructions, and then at the end of the walk, we took the phone away, and we said, okay, do it again from memory, and we'll pay you once you get back. Um, we kept track of the wrong turns people made. We asked them some questions along the way, and what we found, what we found was a, uh, this pattern, this is the number of wrong turns. So higher is worse. White bar is the first time going through the learning phase. So people using this nice automated interface did the automated pan and zoom. They made fewer wrong turns than the people using the Android interface who had to do some finger work to figure out their next, uh, their next turn. People on the, the Google phone made a lot more wrong turns the first time. Worse performance. But when these folks had to go back and walk the route again, the Apple people showed more wrong turns than the Google people. So what we've got is a trade-off here between performance, doing a route the first time, and learning. So, I took these results to Apple folks and to Google folks and said, you realize you're baking into your system priorities. You're either guiding your users towards learning or you're guiding them towards getting to their destination accurately and quickly. And then they're going to come back. The, these folks using the iPhone, they're more likely to depend on this system again the next time because they didn't learn that much the first time around. The reason I'm going into 
so much depth on this one here is because I have firsthand experience with shopping these findings around the tech companies and finding that not only was I as an academic geographer speaking a very different language than them, they actually didn't even care about what effect their software caused. Because, and, and this is, you know, the, 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 this is maybe more a story of the, te of the business side of things. I'm not plotting um, advertising impressions on here. So that's, that's a, a completely separate issue here. But I think this is another missed opportunity where folks in industry can actually pick what they want their software to do. They can pick what behavior they want to encourage. They can pick what they want to guide their users towards. And that might involve learning some of the academic techniques of how to run a behavioral study and how to collect data so that you can put a plot like this up in a meeting and say, okay, let's pick. What do we want to encourage in our users? I've spent a lot of time harping on, the, on missed opportunities, hopefully identifying things that, uh, that may come to fruition in the future. I should end on a more positive note because uh, I really think that this story is all about possible connections between the academic and industry worlds. A few um, projects that I think do very well at melding these two approaches are um, uh, in cartography, uh, say in uh, cartographers picking color palettes can now depend on, they can turn to the work from Penn State folks under the name of Color Brewer and find a nice set of pre-made templates that guide them through the process of picking how to build their map. The fact that this was built as a nice little accessible web app also has meant that open source projects have been able to pick up on this palette and you can find it buried deep within the D3 visualization sorry, visualization library, you don't even have to go and use the web app in the future. I, small little point of contact between the academic world and industry, uh, but I think this really solves some very practical problems for people who are trying to build uh, 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 cartographic displays of data. Also, at, this, at the same time as new visualization tools have come out for the web platform, I think it's great we've got a little rediscovery of the fact that there are different projections besides Web Mercator. And now, with libraries like D3, folks on the industry side, it's not just that they have more options, it's that they have an opportunity to learn some of the academic research that have gone into looking at what's the right projection for that kind of data, for telling the specific story you want to tell. And uh, Web Mercator sometimes is the answer to that question, sometimes it is not. Uh, another really nice touch point has been in what the academic folks call volunteer geographic information, what the industry folks might call, oh, open street map. Yeah, I've tried that. Uh, this is where, where academics have been able to work with open street map data to identify not just the patterns of how people choose to contribute information about their surroundings, but some of the more complex dynamics of if you have a map that's now uh, been in existence for 10 years, what are some of the areas that get edited and re-edited and hopefully improved over time? So both academics and uh, hobbyists and industry folks have been able to come together around this data set and these questions of not just how do we build a comprehensive map of the world, but how should that be done?
so I, I've spent a lot of time jumping through very, very specific projects, very specific topics. A few takeaways that I see here are that the successful combinations, the successful uh, efforts that involve both industry and academic folks, on the academic side, it, work, it only works when that journal article is not behind a paywall, when folks in industry who are searching Google can actually read your paper. That's a whole battle unto itself there where academic journals can cost $30,000 a year. Uh, it's one thing for an ac uh, academic library to pay for that. It's another for a startup to justify $30,000 a year to get a journal article, or well, to get a journal subscription. Also, the successful connections between the academic side and the industry side, I think, have come not just in the form of a journal article being thrown over the transom, but in the form of a web page, a web app, a demo, a presentation, something that's a small interactive nugget. On the industry side, I have seen companies that do know how to use Google Scholar and do a little searching, a little poking. I'm, I'm glad to work for one of them right now where, where some thought goes into maybe not doing a comprehensive literature review before tackling a new project, but at least there's this step of saying, oh, what have others done before? What can we learn from, uh, from say someone who has pseudo, written pseudocode for this algorithm that uh, uh, maybe we don't have to reinvent from scratch. I've yet to, I'm, I'm waiting to see a citation of a journal article in a open source project, in a comment line, in a bit of code. Um, that's, I, I'm really looking forward to that because I think that's where we can finally get some concrete touch points. What I have seen so far is I have seen companies that have people on staff called geographer or cartographer. I'm sure the day-to-day -day reality of what that involves is another question, uh, but that's certainly a touch point between these two sides. Uh, also the fact that um, Phosphor G has both academic and industry tracks is, I think, a very nice uh, melding of these two worlds. I've cut this a little close. I've gone on in a lot of depth. So I'm just going to end with the promise of open source software being our salvation. The fact that open source software means that code is visible to academics, that code is visible to industry folks, that a comment in a piece of open source software can reference a peer reviewed journal article, that academics can use open source software in their studies, maybe their behavioral studies of of how people actually navigate or how people actually solve everyday geographic problems. Um, this isn't going to happen overnight. Open source software is not going to, to refund the Harvard Geographic Department. At the same time, I think it gives us very concrete touch points. Uh, this, this whole conference is about open source software. Uh, so I, I, won't, I won't give an overview of it all other than to say the company I work for, MapZen, which is focused on solving geographic problems with open source software, we're building out a modular stack of pieces and anyone who would like to either put in a comment that references a peer reviewed journal article or sees a way that this software can be useful towards their industry applications, um, I think that can move, move us along towards having some better connections between research, between application, <coughs> maybe not a dinner party with a British Don, but at the same time, bring together folks who are all asking similar questions. So thank you very much for your time. 
and uh, I, I appreciate it. Thanks.